Hey everybody, welcome to Goots' Wrestling Pod. I'm your host, Ray Goots, and we're talking about Great American Bash 1990, and it's Tom, brother. It's Vader Tom. You like that oh, shirt? Oh, that's a nice Vader shirt. I actually like that. Okay, that's my, that's was that my... WWE made? Yeah, that was for the, when he went into the Hall of Fame last year. Oh, after he died, when they had a chance to put him in before he died. Ah. But ah, whatever. Man, hopefully his son got a few dollars off the shirt, so... It's Vader time. Um, guys, really quick, we're recording this Monday night right after all. We dropped this on Fridays. As of as of now, CM Punk has caused a lot of drama. We're not gonna get into it though, because I gotta I gotta go take care of some stuff. And uh, I'm sure he's gonna cause some more drama by Friday. So they'll probably storm out of the company by fucking Thursday. So how was Raw? It, it was it sucked. It was a waste of time. Oh, nothing happened. Okay, forget it. I thought I was gonna be like, dude, you wouldn't believe what's happened. No, Cody cool. Rhodes took a shit in the middle of the ring. I've been like, dude, I gotta start I'll watching. Tell you it. Shit, Trish and Trish and Becky, their mess fucking stunk. Wait, that was on Raw. Yeah, that no hype. They mentioned it once. They had the match. I'm telling you right now. I, we can't get into Mars stuff. We gotta go right into it. But I'm telling you right now, something's going on with Becky. I'm telling you right now. But I, but anyway. Uh, you know what was not going on with Becky Lynch? Great American Bash 1990, because she wasn't there. Maybe she wasn't the crowd. Who's to say? Um, Andrew, overall, what do you think of this event? I liked it. Yeah, it's it's all right. You know, it's got some good matches. Yeah, it's not the best pay per view you're ever gonna see, but it's got its high points, right? Yeah, I mean, you know what? I you know what? I put it on last night, and the first thing you hear is the microphone feedback. Because this has always been hyped as like the 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 like a really great pay per view back then and like what a mm-hmm. match thing. And the Pro Wrestling Illustrated like because they had access to these events and the WWE was like oh this was so much better than WrestleMania and I'm like how can you say that when they can't even get the microphone to work when the show begins? Yeah, it's dude, it's it's noticeably it's noticeably not better than WrestleMania. Yeah, like. None of the WrestleMania so far. So far at this point, we've seen six WrestleMania, right? This is not better than any. But it had better matches. Yeah. Like, it's, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sometimes it did. Um, this might be one of the better NWA pro, uh, or WCW pay per views. So I'll, I'll give it that. As of now, yeah, it is. Um, but you know, like even like the first thing you see in the ring, and this wound up being actually being a good match. It's like a guy who is, like, cosplaying as your main guy, and he just looks like a shittier version of your guy. And But you were supposed to take him seriously, and I'm just like, why is this the first person that we see on this show? Like, there's so many little things that they didn't put in consideration that I feel like now, because we, like, have listened to, like, Vince's philosophy for, like, 40 years. Um, But, yeah, I'm talking about Buddy Landau. Like, why? Also, why didn't anyone tell him, don't dress like that? What are you doing? Actually, we'll get into that because I have a different opinion than you on that. But we'll get into it. All right, let's, let's... We're going to talk about Great American Bash 1990, the new revolution. <laughs> happens to us. It no. happens on July 7th, 1990 in the Baltimore Arena. Supposedly 14,000 in attendance. So this is actually pretty high for WCW standards. You know, sometimes they've been reviewing the reviews where they drew 7,000. Or even two thousand sometimes. This is double that. That is fourteen k. So that's pretty good, I think, for them. The intro video is of like Sting's face and Ric Flair's face and stuff, superimposed on pictures of our founding fathers. This is what exactly they were thinking about when they were founding this country. They were like, one day, a guy with fucking Native American makeup on his face will take over my face. Mm-hmm. JR and Bob Cottle, they uh, introduce us and they go through the card of everything that's going to happen, including the North American debut of Big Ben Vader. They mentioned that. And we're going to go to that first match, as Ray mentioned. Match number one, Nature Boy, Buddy Landell. He's back. That's right. He is back from his cocaine addiction versus Brian Pillman, whose music starts fucking late. Right? He's already halfway to the ring when this music fucking starts. Wow. NWA, WCW, never fucking changed. It's like, I feel like 
in the beginning, it re- they were really fucking up on accident. But after a while, I think they did it like on purpose for good luck. Like, so, hey, we got to fuck up something technically because it's our good luck charm. I think that's what they did. I swear. It has they, just to be. So, they just do so many little things wrong and you're just like already annoyed at the show. Dude, there hasn't been a single pay-per-view we've seen of WCW and WA where there isn't some kind of technical glitch, whether it be the mic the sound system, the lighting. They're doing this on purpose. They can't be this fucking stupid. I think they, they can't are. be this bad. <laughs> I think what, we, what we're learning from Dixie Carter and Tony Khan is everyone who tries to promote wrestling besides Vince McMahon is a brain dead moron. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even Vince McMahon Jr. himself has become a brain dead moron. He, he, it happens to all. brain dead moron uh, moments in his 40 years. Yes. Yeah. Would you say Paul Heyman when he was doing ECW was a brain dead moron? Um, no, Paul Heyman knows how to. Uh, Paul Heyman, I was thinking about it. Like, if you told somebody in 1990 and 2023, Paul Heyman's still like in the main events of WWE, um, people wouldn't believe it. Paul Heyman, you know, why Paul, he- Paul Heyman's willing to shed things that don't work. And what I mean by that is he's not still sitting at a convention screaming ECW was the best. He, yeah, he's moved on. He's 100% moved on. on. He does, and, and, and a lot of these guys just can't – a lot of these guys can't just throw things away that don't work anymore. They're just like, but the Four Horsemen, but the NWO, but – and and Paul Heyman. But the ECW Arena. Yeah, and we have the ECW Arena. But, but, you know, like the Attitude Era and Paul Heyman is just like, what is next? And he's like the only guy. He's a, he's I would say he's a survivor, bro. He really is. Dude, Vince yeah. McMahon wanted nothing to do with him in 2006. And now he's like, I think he's more involved than we even realize in the company. Anyway, back to our first match. Brian Pillman wins with a top rope crossbody. For those of you who don't know, Buddy Landell, he's called Nature Boy, and he's like a, almost like a spitting image of Ric Flair because initially he was supposed to, they were building him up to be a rivalry with the other Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Mm-hmm. But this cocaine addiction got to him and he got thrown out. And he's back because I think he's finished his uh, cocaine addiction. But he's noticeably in worse shape. And they mentioned, they mentioned that. Yeah, they mentioned that, that. He does his body physique is not it. You didn't like this match, right? I wound up, no, it was a good match, but I just think the presentation of this guy is fucking horrendous. And it just sends a horrible message to the viewers. He just looks like a pig. He looks like a lesser version of Ric Flair. And I think it takes away from Ric Flair. Like, it would be like, it would be like having some fucking indie guy just dress like Roman Reigns to do the opening match. But they're not like, Roman, but like Roman isn't mad at him. Roman's just like, yeah, this guy exists. Like the tribal queef, uh, Johnny Johnny Boy Jones. You know what I mean? And he's just walking around with his brothers, Ned and Pete. But they don't acknowledge that they're like ripping off the bloodline. And Jim Cornette's the manager. They just, but they don't acknowledge that it's like the bloodline. And we just have to take him seriously. It's like, that's, it's that stupid. Wasn't me. there like a gimmick like that? Or am I just making this up? In Gilbert, but like. They, no, no, no. Where they were in the same promotion, where one was like a like a blatant like playoff of the major one, or am I just thinking about something else? Uh, this is like the only time I've ever seen where the guy the guy in the opening match is ripping off the guy in the main event, and they don't have like why would the horseman not just beat the shit out of this guy? Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you dressed like Ric Flair and calling yourself the Nature Boy? Was the Renegade and like Ultimate Warrior in the same company at the same time? When, when Ultimate Warrior showed up, Renegade had a completely different gimmick. He was dressing like a Native American, like a, like a real Native American. Like a he wasn't dressing like Ultimate Warrior anymore, and he was a jobber at that point. Like he was dressing like a real Native American. He was, like he was dressing like Tatanka almost. He was a uh, cross between Tatanka and um some other fucking jerk off. He wasn't dressing uh, like Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. Because that could have been like the one of the only other instances where they're both in the same company. One's obviously a blatant rip off the other one, and they don't confront each other. You know, they had the giant. I remember I was watching. They had the giant beat the shit out of him, and he went like, "This guy thought he was the Ultimate Warrior, and he's not." But I'm also going to do that to you, Ultimate Warrior, when I get my hands on you. Um, so they had the giant acknowledge that he was like a rip off, and after he choke slammed him like three times. I mean. 
didn't hate this match because no, I like the match. But what I'm but saying, I I do get your point. Your point, you make absolutely correct sense that it is weird seeing like a worser Ric Flair in the opening match. No, it doesn't get acknowledged or anything. Like this. I I get it. 100%. Yeah, it's just it's just to me, it's like it's almost like you're shitting on Ric Flair, but like he can't. He's not acknowledging it, and no one's acknowledging it. But it's just there in our heads that this. It's just. Why would why can't this guy dress like and if this he's like no I have to dress like Ric Flair then just be like well then you can't wrestle on this show, like I agree, I agree they should have been like anyway. we'll come back I'm glad you fought you're clean now but you can't do this gimmick anymore because the fact when you were doing it we were building you up and you were in better shape you're no longer in good shape you're no longer a challenger now we're just gonna deter from everything I, I agree. After it this match, match, it was a good match though. Yeah, after this match, they throw to Gordon Soley, who just once again goes over the card, talks about it's going to be the debut of Vader. He already did this, but they do it again. But you can see Iron Sheik walking in the, to the ring in the background. It's going to lead to match number two. It is the Iron Sheik versus Captain Mike Rotunda. And uh, basically, the Iron Sheik, he tells uh, Eddie Kingston, yo, hold my beer. Let me show you what a real terrible body looks like. And he That's looks- a steroid gun. Awful. Yeah, he looks awful. He looks pregnant. Like, if you take a needle and you poke them in the stomach, he's going to blow up. He's got a giant Roy gut. It looks disgusting. Mike Rotunda, he gets beat on almost this entire match, and then he wins with a backslide. It helps nobody. Um, what did I don't you think? know. So they forgot. Do you know why this match was on this show? They it's forgot. Pregnant, yes. They forgot that Iron Sheik, Iron Sheik's contract rolled over. They thought they fired him. So he was getting checks, but not telling anybody. And then they discovered it. And like, what the fuck? You've been getting checks. You didn't tell us. And he's like, I don't know, motherfucker. So they were like, well, you have to come and wrestle a Great American Bash, though. You have to come. Uh, because his, 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 he had his, his contract rolled over for another year. So they were like, you have to at least have a match. So he came and had this match. But they're so what? fucking dumb, this company. They forgot to not. They they thought they uh, had stopped the contract. And it went until January 91. He got paid. He had like three matches. Um, that is that is totally on them. That's totally on them. I mean, I get it. Like, you want him to wrestle. But this match was fucking garbage. It was a yeah. waste of time. That's, that's like their fault that they let the contract roll over. That's not Iron Sheik's fault. He didn't do anything wrong. And they should have just took the eat the bullet instead they they were like look we gotta get our money's worth and you gotta fucking ruin this pay-per-view by fucking you gotta ruin by it. beating the shit out of one of the guys we're trying to groom and uh he wins but it does nothing because he wins like a bitch with a backslide it, it does not this 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 match sucked this match yeah. it, this match felt uh, dude i paused after the next match i paused the show and i'm like i can't believe these three matches happened in the first 30 minutes because it felt like it was two hours in after the after the next match. Yeah, the next match. Well, it goes. We're gonna get into it. Um, Gordon Soley, he's with Harley Race. That's right. Even Harley Race is back, and he's got new hair done. Mm-hmm. Nice to make I can give him that young look. And he cuts a promo on Tommy Rich, who he who beat him before for the world title, but he's gonna beat him this time. But he's gonna be watching Flair versus Sting, and. Um, so if you're keeping score, Mike Rotunda, Iron Sheik, and now Harley Race, we're seeing a lot of what? What does it have in common? A lot of WWF rejects are now starting to show back well, up. WCW. Harley Race is not a WWE reject. He was the original NWA champion. So Oh yeah, but then he got rejected. He he got sent back to the minors. Right, but like he, that's he, what it he, felt he, like to me. I was watching a whole bunch of guys get rejected now back here, you know? Okay. Um Match number three, Dirty Dutch Mantel versus Doug Furness, who is the world's strongest man. And they bill him the world's strongest man because of his powerlifting championships. He actually even holds some records. So at this time, that's why he was called that. Uh, Jim Ross says Dutch is not concerned about his appearance during this match. Fucking shit, bro. The guy looks like a troll. Like a, He looks like a real he looks troll. Like- 
he does not he has not lifted a weight ever in his life. He's got this like long remember, by the way, if you guys are not familiar with Dutch Mantel, he's uh Jeb Coulter from like the manager of Alberto Del Rio. But and when he was Swag- young, his goatee is like or his beard is like super long and it's forked. And he's got so much hair. He's got all this back hair. And he's got hair in his form. But here's the weirdest part about him. He doesn't have hair on his upper arm. So Mm -hmm. he's got, like, full back hair. So it looks like he's wearing, like, a fucking uh, sleeveless shirt, like a black sleeveless shirt. And he's got hair, like, thick hair in his form. But only this side is bare. It looks so odd. I had to, like, look it up because I was like, there's no way a woman would want to sleep with this guy, right? Mm-hmm. He's got grandchildren. So I was like, holy shit, there's hope for the rest of us, dude. <laughs> uh, dude, um, he he just just is so unappealing to look at. He is so, just, oh my God. We, oh, you know what it is? Goes. He makes you embarrassed to like, he, he like, I'm so glad I watched this alone. I wouldn't want someone walking in a room to see me watch this guy half naked. <laughs> Everyone owes Albert an apology. <laughs> this guy, oh, he's so hairy. It just like, ugh, like I felt like I could smell this match. He just <laughs> looks like he looks like shit, and like, um. So let's break. So I thought this match was good. Here's my problem: with this match, though, if this guy's yeah. if, if this guy's the world's strongest man, why is he having That's such a hard time with this homeless person? <laughs> yeah, I mean. If this is like, yeah, that's, that's a good point. This isn't a bad match because Doug Dutch Mantel, the only thing that keeps him in the business is that he can actually wrestle. Like, you know, he's a no, pretty no, good. He's, he's been a booker now for like he booked for um Puerto Rico for years. He he wrote for WCW, he wrote for WWE, he wrote for uh TNA. So he's been a booker this whole time. Oh yeah, yeah. But I'm saying like the reason why he's on the show is like, yeah, he, he, he wrestle. Can wrestle like, yeah. the reason why he's in the business looking like the way he looks. Is like he he can he's decent in the ring, right? But you're right. Like if he's going up against like the the supposedly the world's strongest man, this guy's having a a fucking hard time with him, you know. But the finish of the match, Doug Furness, he hits a belly to belly side suplex uh, for the win. Uh, I thought Doug Doug Furness hit some impressive moves. I was ready to like completely like fall asleep on this match. Doug Furness was like hitting some cool moves. I can see why. Uh, but dude, did you hear Jim Ross said Doug Furness is the second best athlete in Oklahoma or something? Did you hear him say that? No, he said that. Yeah, it's like, why would first, you say uh, Dr. Death? Mickey Mantle. I guess Mickey Mantle's from the same era. Why the fuck would you say that? Why would you say this guy's second best? Yeah. If, if he was the world's strongest man, wouldn't he be the best? No one's ever been stronger than him on in this world. Since Jesus, but he's the second best athlete in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, there's a guy better than him in Oklahoma. Why the fuck? Which is Mickey Mantle. And Mickey Mantle's a great baseball player. He wasn't the world's strongest man. Why would you say that? Why would you? You're trying to get this fucking guy over. You have him wrestling a, a, a homeless person. Why would you say this guy's like this? You know what? Actually, he's the fifth best athlete uh, in you know uh, Oklahoma history. Like, come on. Yeah. You know what I was thinking when I was watching this? I was like, because right before this, we watched Buddy Landell. I was like, Buddy Landell, Dutch Mantel, Rick the Model Martel. <laughs> I'm trying to name names. Yeah, <laughs> Who else? Is there anybody else? Uh, no, maybe maybe we'll come up. Maybe we'll find out. Buddy Landell, Dutch Mantel, Rick the Model Martel. If you think Sherry Martel, Sherry you guys Martel. can look over. Oh, yeah, let, me, let us know. Uh, Gordon Soli, he is with Jim Cornette. Who once again runs down the card for the entire show, but then he ultimately focuses on the Southern Boys, who he says the Midnight are going to be tonight. And we're going to go to match number four, and ring announcer, dangerous ring announcer Gary Capetta, tells us this next match has two former great world champions. It's Wildfire Tommy Rich versus Harley Race, dude. Tommy Rich was on the previous show, pay per view, WCW pay per view we watched, right? Where he was like, he was in a tag match against like Brian Pillman or some shit like that, or something like that. I did not know Tommy Rich was like a former world champion. And I was like, is this like a former world champion? You know how he got the belt, right? Yeah, like nobody ever really talks about this guy. And I don't really know anything. You know how he got the belt, right? 
What? You know the story of how he got the belt? No, no, no. Tell me, please. I'm not familiar with Tommy Rich at all. Wow, by God. He, uh, he, he blew a guy. He blew Jim Barnett. He sucked his dick, and that's how he got the belt. Why would he suck Jim Cornette's dick to get the belt? Jim Barnett. Jim Barnett. Oh. Oh, Jim Cornette. He also, he jerked off Jim Cornette. God damn. No, he sucked. He sucked the cock, and then they gained the world title. What was his name? Uh, Josh Barnett? No, not Josh. No, uh, Jim Barnett. He was an old Jim game. Barnett. Yeah, I know Jim Barnett. Uh, is that is that a true story? Yeah, it's pretty much. I mean, if it's not, it's like one of the biggest rumors in here. Uh, no one. If Google Jim Barnett. Yeah, no. There's like a whole shoot interview where you don't think he... this guy. Wouldn't want to get his dick sucked for give you a world title run. Oh my boy, he was like a southern like he was openly gay too, in the south. Was Tommy Rich gay? No, Tommy Rich just won the world title. Okay, Jesus, I gotta look this up after this. Uh, after this, I mean, pod. I mean, I don't know. I listen. It, I I don't know if I was even alive for this world title reign, so I wasn't there. I can't tell you if he definitely sucked a dick. But that has been so that I've heard, dude. I I heard that before I even ever had access to newsletters. I heard that as a kid. So like, it's it's been out there for years. You're right. Jeez, man, that's uh, that is crazy. That's so, just there's something I'm funny. There's something I, I, I want to stop this podcast just so I can start reading up about it. You know? Yeah, it's funny. There's I there's things that I I I. But I'm, I like doing this podcast with you because there's things that you don't know. I'm just shocked you don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's and crazy. It's not like we, everyone knew that this guy sucked a dick. And he got no, back. no, I did not know that. You should have brought it up the first time we talked Tommy Rich. Well, they're this making a big first match we're reviewing of it. I know. They're, well, they're making a big deal now about him being a former world champion. So. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, he's the former world champion. We got two. He can suck a dick tonight. I'll say that much. Wildfire, Tommy Rich versus Harley Race, match number four. Harley Race, he's got a crown on his tights. And Jim Ross goes, it's probably because he's a fan of the Sacramento Kings, right? But this is exactly what I mean, that it felt like I'm watching a whole bunch of WWF rejects. It felt like he he's... got that It felt like he got that made. For like, he thought that like he was going to keep it like, oh, I'll get this, this new outfit made. And Vince was like, eh, you can just go. And he, yeah, he, I'm, not, exactly. I'm not going to give up this singlet. I had it made. Uh, you know, in this match is with two former world champions, right? When Tommy Rich beat Harley Race for the title, this was almost like over six years ago, probably, right? It was like it was like early it was 80s. Like 10 years ago, 10 or seven. Yeah, 10 years ago at this point. So the style of match that they're wrestling, I don't know if this is what they wrestled 10 years ago, but the crowd was not into this match. The style of wrestling they were doing seemed slow, and it seemed really outdated. Ultimately, Tommy Rich wins with a top. Uh, he no, he hits a fucking top rope crossbody, but Harley Race reverses it for the win. What did you think? I, I, you were so right that this was like an old school match. It is crazy how fast people don't people shit on WWE or don't. it's crazy how fast Vince changes. Vince and I would even say Ric Flair change the, the tempo of matches where this match these two guys were like top stars like in 83 top or 82 top top stars now no one gives a fuck because of the way they wrestle yeah it's it is interesting because i guarantee you if like they had pay-per-views in the 70s and the early 80s this match would have been getting like a standing ovation yes yeah exactly and i feel like these guys probably wrestled this type of style match when they had the championship you know and they were like look they were like, look, we're going to give him some of the good stuff. That's probably what they were thinking. And Tommy Rich, when he was like wiping away the cum off his mouth, and he was like, absolutely, this is what we're going to do. And and then like they come to the back, and he's still wiping the cum. And he's like, I don't get it. How come they weren't reacting? How many dicks I got to suck to get a five-star match again? <laughs> anyway, that's see, Let me tell you something, though. At, at people in AEW, if you're having problems in the back, you want to push, just ask to suck some dicks. Yeah. yeah. You'll have a job like Tommy Rich. Tommy Rich, world champion. Tommy Rich, the fucking punkster. You, know? okay, you see TK zipping up. All oh, right, Nemesis is winning the title. 
Ryan Evans winning a title. What, what, why, Tony? No, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And he's just, and Ryan Evans just like spitting out. So, uh, yeah, we're going to put the title on him tonight. This is crazy. I have to look that up. Oh, my gosh. All right, but after this day, after this podcast, match number five, the U.S. tag team titles are on the line. We got who I thought were the smoking guns. No, it's the Southern Boys. The Tracy wild-eyed Smothers. Southern Boys. They're wild-eyed. The wild-eyed Southern Boys, yes. It is Tracy Smothers and Steve Armstrong versus the Midnight Express with Jim Cornette. Um, there's a point in this match where Sweet Stan Lane can showing off his karate moves. And the fucking fans love it. Remember, they're the bad guys. The fans are fucking cheering for Stan. I like Stan Lane a lot. I just think about him. I just fucking really like. I like. I the totally Express. understand why that why FTR copies them all the time, or why that politician's mom had sex with this guy. Yeah, yeah, Lauren Breitbart or whatever, right? Breitbart. Dude, yeah, I, I really like the Midnight Express, man. I would. If Dude, WWE, I really like the Midnight Express too. I really do. I if really WWE like put out, they should be in the Hall of Fame with Jim Cornette. But if WWE put out a DVD of like like a lot of like lost matches, I would buy it in a second. Like, yeah. Um, and you know, here's the thing about his fucking martial arts too. This shit isn't like you think. Like, oh, it must be like hokey shit because they're bad guys. No. It's not bad. Like, his fucking stances and his kicks, they're not bad. And they even tell us, this is the reason why they're not bad. He's actually been practicing karate for a long he was, uh, for a long time. They even mentioned that, I don't know how true this is, but that he even used to be a karate instructor. That's why he got to move. Yeah. Um, here's another fact I learned about Stan Lane. He is the only man trained to be a wrestler by Ric Flair. Woo! Yeah. Anyway... The finishing, the finishing sequence of this match is very fast-paced. Basically, there's a hot tag, which brings in Steve Armstrong, and they hit an assisted dropkick um, on Stan Lane. But the referee he doesn't make the count because he's busy. And then the Midnight uh, Express, they hit the rocket launcher on Steve Armstrong, and it goes gets a two count. And while everybody is like, the Midnight Express, they get mad about that and they start arguing with the ref while, while they're, everyone's distracted with the referee. Tracy Smothers changes places with Brad Armstrong because they look fairly similar. Mm-hmm. And fucking, um, what do you call it? Bobby Eaton doesn't realize it and he tries to go pick up and he gets cradled for a two count. This, in my opinion, was one of the best switch roofs I've ever seen in wrestling. It like, actually made sense to where they're doing it. And it looked natural. But that's not the finish. Uh, Ultimately, uh, while the ref is trying to get Brad Armstrong out of the ring, Stan Lane hits uh, Tracy Smothers in the back of the head with a Zabat kick Mm -hmm. while he's running the ropes. And then that allows Bobby Eaton to cradle him for the win. Here's the thing. Technically, because of that switcheroo, the legal man who was Steve Armstrong, he did not get pinned. Right? So technically, they pinned the wrong guy. But it doesn't matter. In this pay-per-view, the Midnight Express wins in the longest match of the night at 18 minutes. I like this match a lot. What did you think? Yeah, I liked it a lot, too. Um, I was glad you liked it. Uh, So uh, uh, this is apparently when people do the top 10 WCW matches of all time, this is always in like the top five. This is really like the wrestler's favorite WCW match. This is huh? CM Punk has said this is like one of his favorite matches of all time. Um, really yeah this is like a match that so i was like expecting a little bit i liked it but like i don't i i don't know I'll, i guess when when we're done watching you know because there's eventually there's an end to wcw co- you know coming up um but i thought it was really good i and i thought it was like a really good example of what the midnight express could do in the big stage and but yeah this is on a lot of people's like mount rushmore of tag matches and this is in a lot of top 10 when people make top 10 wcw matches this is always on it do they ever um yeah the, i would say if you don't i know it's 18 minutes and if you're like i just want to if you just watch the ending sequence it's so fast paced and everything makes sense do they ever bring up the fact that they ping they pinned the wrong man in this match um no no people just like it but i think that I think that even works because then it builds to a rematch, which never really happens. The Midnight Express leave after after October. Oh, they never bring it up, huh? Oh, it's too bad. Because I would, I would, 
I thought the reason why they did that was you're right. It's actually built to a rematch. It's and they didn't yeah, know like, like, like you pinned the wrong guy. Like you yeah. didn't pick, you didn't pin, like you didn't really beat us. Now we we deserve a rematch kind of situation. That's was, what I thought was going to happen. It was really good. And like when you see a match like this, you're like, I understand why you want to have like four or five tag matches on a show, but not every tag match is going to be as good as this. And um, which, which, which happens for the rest of with this pay per view. It wasn't like overloaded with tag matches. I think it was a good even, you know, number. Like if you think about it in the beginning of this, there's the first three matches are first four matches actually are singles matches. This is the first tag match. So this is a, there's, there is a good balance to this pay-per-view, I will say that. Yeah. Okay? The word in Soli, he is with the Freebirds who are trying their best to rip off Adrian's street. They look uh, fucking okay. they look Yeah, with the look fucking look. hooker makeup and the fucking glitter all over their face. They cut a promo on the Steiners. Um, but that's going to come later on because we're going to go to match number six. It is Z-Man versus uh, the man making his North American debut. Vader. Vader. Comes with his fucking helmet. He fucking takes off the fucking helmet. And Falcado's like, I think it's a samurai headpiece. Really? <laughs> and then Vader starts doing these fucking like samurai fucking things. He is, by the way, Vader's original mask is like way more full. Like it's like a full mask instead of the jock strap he wears later on. I actually like his original mask. Better. I yeah. love it. I think, yeah, I think it looks better. Actually, it does look better. But anyway. He does the um, fucking samurai stuff, and then the fucking fumes start shooting out of the helmet. Did they ever explain, like, how they controlled that? Uh, yeah, I heard it in the Vader episode of one of Conrad's podcasts. I can't remember, but oh. it, was a, it was a pain in the ass for him to, to, him, for him to travel with. Yeah, I'm sure. It, it's probably heavy and stuff. I bet he was, it was just, it was, I bet it was some guy in the back just pressing a button. No, I think, I think Vader hit the button. Vader hit the button? Yeah, was, Vader was doing it. Yeah, I don't know how he did it. It was because a- I'm watching this, and that's what I was looking for, but I don't ever see him hitting it. I don't know. He he does it. Uh, Maybe he, when he's taking it off, he presses a button, and there's like a 10-second delay, yeah. and then it comes out. Maybe Dude, this, this is the... Uh, you know, I like, all, I like a lot of the matches, and Brian Pillman looks great. This is the first guy who looks like a... On the show, looks like a superstar. He looks like a cartoon character come to life like it's like oh shit when he walks out he commands the screen more than anyone else on that show he's like ready he's like ready to be a star yeah yeah absolutely he yeah. looks like I, I feel like when he came out i was like because like when i was i was like he's in the wrong company and yeah. it's the first time i ever really felt that way because when i was a kid watching Vader was one of, I thought, like, he was one of the real, like, um, like, to me, like, represented WCW for yeah, a long so he, time. And he, he winds up becoming that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But to see him here, and it's his first time showing up, I'm watching this going, like, man, he's in the wrong company. Like, he should have always started off in WWE. Yeah. Can you imagine if he, if he, like, we don't know, it's like, we don't know anything about this guy. He walks... Like Hogan just beat Earthquake and he walks out dressed like that. We'd be like Hulk Hogan's fucking done. Yeah, why didn't um why didn't he why didn't W why didn't Junior sign this guy? I don't think he wanted to be signed. Well, you know what he got with WCW he wasn't gonna get with WWF. He still got to go to Japan a lot. Maybe that's why, because he was like, I brother, I wanna go to W I wanna go to Japan. I, I, was, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. this Japan, is a this is a good cool, I think this was a, they did a good job. With mm-hmm. Dave, by day, I mean WCW did a good job debuting him here because basically it is a fucking just a quick squash match. Cl- uh, Vader hits a clothesline and a big splash for the win in one of the safest Vader squash matches I've ever seen. Because I've seen some Vader squash matches where he is just super unsafe with the fucking jobbers, like just really hitting them or hurting them. But this looks safe. The two-minute match, it's the sh- right after the longest match of the pay-per-view, we get the shortest match. Um, yeah, I well, thought he good. came out looking good. Yeah, I really like this squash match. And, and he didn't just beat a loser, too. I mean, Z-Man is... Yeah. He's not, like, the top guy, but he's he's like a name at least, right? He's positioned as someone that, to pay attention to. So, yeah, so for yeah. me. 
but no man what a fucking debut for vader and um yeah you're right it's like it's like a wwf guy wandered over there like wait what are you doing yeah. here? Be here? <laughs> absolutely all right so gordon Stoli, he is with the four horsemen who cut a promo on horn uh paul orndorff uh, junkyard uh, uh ellie gante these are the, the dudes with attitudes and when I was watching, I couldn't even pay attention because I was just looking at these guys thinking, this is the weirdest grouping of horsemen I've ever seen. Like, I like I just, they, don't look, they don't look like, they don't look well together to me. See, when I was a kid, I liked them because you have Arn Anderson, who's like the enforcer. You have Barry Windham, who's like the technical wrestler. You have Ric Flair, who's the champ. And you have Sid Vicious, who's the muscle. So I kind of like that dynamic. Um, I... Yes, and to me, it just, I don't know, it just looked odd to me. It just, I don't, I don't think, like I think ultimately did. Sid doesn't belong in the horse. Yeah, Sid does not belong there. And um, Barry Windham just, like, yeah, he doesn't look like he fits there to me either. You know, he just doesn't. Like, he just, like, I don't know, like, he looks dirty is, like, the best way to explain yeah. it. Because you know what? Like, when the horsemen were originally, like, Tully, Tully, Tully looked nice, right? Tully, a Ric Flair looked nice, and it was like you, you know, what a Jim Hurt, no, not well, JJ Dillon looked kind of nice. They guys are all wearing yeah, suits. Yeah, I, yeah, I got it. I got that the Andersons were the rugged looking ones because that's it made sense. Like, oh, they're Anderson. That family's weird like that. But you got like Barry Windham, like with the fucking. He just looked. He just doesn't look like. Well, camp and Sid just doesn't. I, I don't like this grouping. It's just very weird. It throws me off for me first. Just throws me off. Anyways, you know what else throws me off? The fucking fabulous Freebirds. Let me tell you that. Match number seven is the Freebirds versus the Steiners. And the Freebirds, like I said, they're wearing like these glittery outfits and they're got all this makeup on. And they, the crowd, you know what they're trying to go for? They're, they're trying to go for a homosexual thing. The crowd is super against it. They cut to the crowd. They during this match, they cut to the crowd and they show the crowd chanting "faggot" at the Freebirds. Is it like another point where they're like chanting "Michael is a bitch"? Even the commentators are getting in on this gay stuff. Like Jim Ross goes, "They have interesting makeup on. Wouldn't it? Would it be very popular in San Francisco? Get it? You know, you're probably wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They'd be popular in San Francisco." And then Bob Cotto goes. Yeah, with the gay man. <laughs> like, Dude, I was like, this, Jesus, this, Bob. this whole thing, like, really, really ruined the match for me. I, I, Dude, I'm not enjoying the Steiners as much as I thought I was going to. Like, I enjoyed Scott Steiner in this match. I would say that. Um, the Freebirds, they used to be, like, a rock and roll thing. And I guess this is, like, they're getting into the glam rock. I have no idea what's going on. I No, I think that they, they, they like, ran out. They were, like, they ran out of ideas. Like, what if we just pretended to be gay? And uh, oh. and they I, they go right back to how they looked previously. So I think they tried it for just, like, the summer. And then they went back. Oh, okay. I just, dude, they just, they look like guys who drug women. It just doesn't matter. Yeah, but they don't even, like, look like, they're not believable. It's no. not even believable in the role. That's the thing. Yeah, it's not believable. Yeah. They look um, like slobs. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I really like the Steiners in this match. Like, you know when they did that? This is the first time where I'm really, like, they did that famous Steiner pose, you know, where, like, he crawls under the legs and the fucking crowd pop for that. Mm-hmm. Um, dude, I, I don't know if you remember this, but do you remember when TNA worked with, like, New Japan back in, like, 2008? And, like, they did. They actually did Wrestle Kingdom. I think one and two together, TNA and fucking New Japan Pro Wrestling, right? Okay. And in Wrestle Kingdom two, Steiner brothers doing a match, but Scott Steiner looks like Big Papa Pump, right? You know, with the fucking blonde hair, goatee and shit. And they still do that Steiner pose where like he fucking gets on his hands and knees and he crawls underneath him, and the crowd fucking pops for that. That's fucking iconic, but I fucking love that. But they do it here. Um, they do this. They're in, this, they're in this match. There's this weird, really weird. It's one of the weirdest body slam reversals I've ever seen. Rick Steiner and fucking uh, Jimmy Jam Garvin. They do this weird body slam reversal. Go check it out if you guys get a chance. Tell me if it's like a name of a move or something. But anyway, um, the finish happens when Scott Steiner hits the Frankensteiner on Michael Hayes. It looks great. That Frankensteiner. 
And then Jimmy Garvin, he hits a DDT on Scott Steiner, but he's not the legal man. So referee's like shoving him away, get out of here. And while that's happening, Rick comes in and hits a belly to belly suplex on a dizzy Michael Hayes and then puts Scott on top for the win. I like the finish and I thought Scott Steiner came out looking good in this match. Yeah, it was okay. It just it did just the free birds turned me off. I just I, I just Yes. The more I see of them, the less I like them. And I don't know. I just feel it's a waste of the Steiners having wrestled these losers. Um, yeah, but they got at least Steiners won. You know, I was like, yeah, like man, you they had to they had to win. I you know, this is like I think Scott Steiner was the first guy I personally ever saw do a hurricane. Right, yeah. mm-hmm. and it's a fucking super impressive. It look because he's a big fucking dude. But he's doing it to my, well, you know that's even like he's doing it to Michael Hayes. It's not like he's doing it to like Rey Mysterio. He's made yeah, it yeah, Hayes. exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like when you right. see, like it's crazy that he was doing that. He was so athletic. Well, the thing about it is he's well, someone once said I forget who it was. Someone said like he had to be the guy to bring that move into America. Because no one was going to tell him, I'm not going to take that move. Because he'd beat the shit out of you. So, like, cause if you suggested that move to, like, Harley Race, like, five years before, you'd be like, fuck you, I'm not doing that. But Scott Steiner, you know, is, like, a tough guy. So you're like, all right, I'll take the move. And then the movie became popular. Ah, I see. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very, yeah, very good had, point. It had to be him to do the move. Because you think Michael Hayes was going to do, like, a Hurricane Rana for J- Jushin Thunder Liger or someone? No. He's not doing that. I wonder what got even Scott Steiner to want to do that. Uh, Japanese wrestling, I believe. Really? Uh, okay. All right. That makes sense, too. That makes sense, too, actually. Yeah. Um, they hype Halloween Havoc, which is going to take place on October 27th. So this, that is weeks. going to be what? We're coming out in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but for this timeline, it's going to be like a few months away, like three months yeah. away. We're going to go to match number eight. It is a six man tag. That's three on. That's a trios match for you folks. Uh, it is the Horseman, Arn Anderson, who is a television champion, Sid Vicious, and Barry Windham versus Paul Orndorff, Junkyard Dog, and El D- El Gigante, who these guys are known as the dudes with attitudes. People love Sid. They love Sid Vicious. He's a bad guy, but they love him. They chant. There's a Sid chant. There's a fucking guy with a sign that says Sid rules. And like, you're going, we want Sid. We want Sid. Dude, people love, I just, I like Sid. I, he's got such intensity. I, I love, love Sid. Him. When he got signed by WWE, I was like, here we go. Hulk Hogan part two. Let's fucking go. I liked Sid Justice in WWF. I did. I was a fan of that. Both yeah. Psycho Sid and the regular Sid Justice one. I like He doesn't that. get enough credit. I really like Sid too. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't get enough credit. Yeah. Anyways, uh, the good guys win by disqualification because what they do is they throw Junkyard Dog over the top rope. And at this time in WCW, that's considered a disqualification. Um, El Gigante, Gigante, he is on the apron the whole time. And after the DQ win, then he decides to come into the ring. Everybody leaves. And And he looks around going like, why are you leaving? Oh, why are you leaving? I just got here. It was so stupid. So yep. I mean, what did you think? Yes. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Uh yeah. I, you know, I that over the top rope rule. I hated it as a kid. To me, it, it like that. Like to me, I was like as a kid, I was like, why? Why would you keep that rule? That just takes the fun out of wrestling. Because I just felt like maybe I'm imagining it. I feel like in WWE, you just got thrown over the top rope every 20 seconds. People were throwing each other over the top rope. Like yeah. why? And why would that be a disqualification? Why would you, you know, why would that, why would that be such a horrible act that we have to end the match right now? Like, it just and and you know, like that rule actually, even in WCW, it wasn't like so consistent because they wouldn't enforce it sometimes because it's yeah, hard. Like, to if Lex Luger was running towards the ropes and then Ric Flair pulled down the ropes and he went over, that's not a DQ. Yeah. But isn't it? Really, like he's still sending the guy over, right? It would be one thing if they sold it like death. Like if they established that if you if you get thrown on the top rope, you die basically. Like you have to go to the hospital. Then I could understand, but like people just get back up and like act like nothing happened. So why is that such a problem? You might as well just you might as well everything might might as well be a disqualification. Wasn't that like a Bill Watts mandate? No, he he brought it. He he made it enforced, but they had that for years before Bill Watts showed up. 
I don't know why, what the logic was to have it. They, there must have been some angle in the 50s, the 60s, where a guy got thrown over the top rope and basically was lying there like a sack of shit. And they were, in the, and they were like, okay, that's we're banning that now. Like, there must have been like some angle that established like that you can't do that. But they never really, they just never, like, I wish Jim Ross, was like, yeah, you know, ever since the 67 injury to Johnny Tarzan, we can't do this anymore. That's why there's qualified. Just give me a reason why this is happening. Yeah, yeah, it's re- I I was you're right. It just it's just very out of place. It would be like if yeah. WWE suddenly was like it was suddenly was like if you do the pile driver you're disqualified. But they would give a reason like oh, you know, because Austin got got paralyzed 20 years ago. Like yeah, yeah. I um I mean eventually WCW gets rid of it, bro. And yeah. I'm uh looking forward to that day, I'll tell you that. I think when Bischoff takes control, yeah. because Bischoff had And happened. I'm also a big fan of wrestling matches where you do go over the top row. I think visually it looks fucking cool. I just, I don't know, as a kid, and maybe, but I just felt like WWE guys just got thrown on the top row every 20 seconds. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's part of the fun of the Royal Rumble. Rumble. That, that's also the part of the fun of the Royal Rumble. When you go over the top row, it's fucking so cool, you know? Because um, there's a little bit of danger to it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Gordon Soli, he is with Lex Luger, who cuts a promo on me, Mark, and he also shows support for his fucking fellow stable mate, Sting. And we're going to go right into our match number nine. It's for the U.S. title. Me, Mark, with Paul Lee, dangerously, versus the champion, Lex Luger. Uh, Lex Luger, he puts the uh, torture rack on me, Mark, which is pretty impressive because Undertaker is a huge dude. But while he's doing that, he kind of like hits the referee and there's a ref bump. And Paulie comes in and fucking uses his cell phone on Mark's on on Luger's ribs, and he saves me, Mark. However, Lex Luger is still able to overcome, and he hits a fucking clothesline for a quick, very quick three count victory. But what did you think of match number nine? Uh, I, I kind of think the the great match streak Lex was on is over, but um, it's not his fault. It was more me, Mark's fault. So yeah. this is the match. This is a historic match too because. Bruce Pritchard's like, I want to bring in Mark, mean Mark. And he shows Vince this match. And Vince is like, not impressed. No. And so Bruce has to be like, please just meet with him. Can I just fly him in so you can meet with him? And he's like, all right, I'll meet with him. And um, that was that. But yeah, man, he, he Vince watched this match. I was like, I'm not hiring this guy. I actually like this match. I, I didn't think I didn't think either guy looked bad. I, I, I'm wondering if like that's why Lex and Undertaker never worked together in WWE because um and, you know what they they were tag team partners because Undertaker probably like yeah I almost didn't get hired because this fucking match I'm never working with you fuck you you know what I mean? or maybe like Vince maybe thought like oh I saw this match and I don't think these guys have chemistry maybe that's what he I mean thinking. yeah I, I I mean maybe down the road if Lex had stayed they would have worked together but um yeah it was interesting to watch these guys wrestle and. Again, this is the last pay per view match of me, Mark. Next time we see him at Survivor Series 90. So, yeah. I am, by the way, uh, I actually like me, Mark. Like, not Undertaker. I like me, Mark. He's not bad. He's, he's like, yeah, he's just not bad. You know, I don't think he's bad at all. Um, You're a mean guy. Yeah. So, uh, where did I leave off? Ah, okay. Gordon Soley. He is with Sting. Sting mentioned how his knees back. Oh, so this actually ties into everything with the Lex Luger. We watched like two, three pay per views in a row where Lex Luger is going for the title and he loses. And it's because like they had their mindset on like I'm we want to drop it. Sting. Clear, yeah. yeah, we want to drop it to Sting. And Sting gets unfortunately injured and he's out for a month. And they're just like, we don't care. We still want to drop it to Sting. We don't want Lu- We don't want to drop it to Luger. We want to drop it to Sting, and that's why they made Lex Luger look like a bitch the whole time. Yeah, because that's... they're saving it for Sting. Yeah. Jesus, that yeah, yeah. I mean, it did. Okay, uh, I get that. I get. It. I don't agree with it. I get it. All right. So I think you could have made both guys. I think you could have had yes. um, two guys. That's why I disagree. I feel like you could have made both guys. You could have Luger Luger win the belt and then drop it on a house show or something else and then add Sting beat Flair anyway. Um, And you could add two top guys. Instead, Luger was always uh, second best. And when they tried to make him the man, it never really worked. So Yeah, 
That's true. I agree. I agree with you. But anyway, Sting's talking about it's kind of Karoma hanging about his his knee is back, and how he says this time he's gonna have his fucking buddies outside, so there's no interference. See, if he loses, there's no excuse. All right, and that's what he was trying to mention. He did not mention the little stingers at all, so I was a little annoyed at that. Well, fuck him. Yeah. This is why fucking RoboCop's not there, because he was like, Sting, you change. You stop caring about the little stingers, so I'm not going to be there anymore. We're going to go to our penultimate match, match number 10. It is for the tag team, world tag team titles, Rock and Roll Express versus the champions, Doom with Theodore Long. This is kind of a boring match. You know, uh, these teams do not have any chemistry together. But two at the styles. end, what? Two different styles. It's two yeah, different two different styles. styles, and it's not meshing. Sometimes two different styles can mesh. This is not one of them. But at the end, this is what happens. Hitty hit Long, he's on the bottom of the fucking apron, and Gibson fucking, uh, like, like somehow Theodore Long gets in the ring and fucking, like, Gibson, like, punches him and he falls down, and then He's picking him up, and as he's picking up te- uh, Teddy Long, you could hear Teddy Long shouting, no, no, no. So Gibson, like, throws him, turns around, and he gets hit with, like, a fucking Butch Reed flying shoulder block uh, for the Doom to win. Uh, what did you think of match number 10? I, I liked it more than the Steiner Shrebird match, but you're right, it was boring, and the finish was kind of interesting. Um, it had two different styles, but I did like it more than the Freebirds match. So... I didn't love it, but I liked it. Yeah, I can say if you liked it better than the Freebirds match, I think that's that's fair. Yeah, I can understand that 100%. Gordon Soli, he is with Ric Flair in an empty arena. And Ric Flair tells him, I got a $2,000 suit on, bitch. Mm-hmm. And he goes, Sting has to beat, he, if he wants to be the man, he's got to beat the man. I fucking love it. Good promo. Good quick promo. They throw it back to the commentators who say wrestlers are going to be around the ring so the horsemen don't interfere. I like this as well. Because this also makes sense. There's continuity because, like, every fucking time Lex Luger was going for it, the horsemen kept interfering. So this is, like, making sense. We're going to go to match 11 for the world title. Sting versus champion Ric Flair, who comes alone. No woman. The dudes with attitudes. This is like the Steiners. The dudes with attitudes was like a stable, and it's got like Sting's in it, Lex Luger's in it, the Steiner brothers are in it, G- Junkyard Dog's in it, Paul Orndorff's in it, uh, El Gigante's in it. But anyway, only the Steiner brothers, Junkyard Dog, and Paul Orndorff are ringside. Jim Hurd, he's out there with fucking Ole Anderson, and he basically handcuffs Ole. The El Gigante, and they fucking sit on some chairs on the fucking rampway. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of this match is Sting no sell. Just he'll get hit, and he just like no sells it. And um, Sting has like the you know the edge most of this match. Like he's dominating most of this match, but then Ric Flair will like attack his like fuck his left knee because remember that's the knee that got injured, and then he'll take over. But then you know Sting will get. This fucking uh, edge back, but then like Flair will attack his knee and then he'll fucking fall again. It's just, you know, re- rinse and repeat. But people love it. Fans love it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, Sting gets the Scorpion Deathlock on and then the fucking horsemen all calm down. But the dudes with attitudes, they keep him from getting into the ring. And then Flair does like a cover with his feet on the ropes with Scott Steiner knocks his feet off and like fans are going crazy because they, they're seeing a tide turning. Flair goes for the figure four, but Sting cradles it. Turns it into a cradle for the win. He wins the world title. People are going crazy. Sting goes up to the ramp, you know, and uh, fucking you see a giant Sting face come down. It's like on fire. Yeah. yeah, it's on fucking fire. I thought it was, dude, I thought it was, it was like his next challenger sending him a message like, like, I'm going to kill you, Sting. <laughs> like, like, yeah, but it's not. It was, supposed to be, it was supposed to be like fireworks with Sting's face, but it just looks like his face is on fire. And Gordon Soul is interviewing Sting, and he just starts cutting a very respectful promo on Ric Flair, going like, Ric Flair was a fucking respectable champion. I'm going to try my best to fill his shoes. That was my feeling. Yeah, and Gordon Soul is like, how do you feel? 
I can feel it, but he just ignores him and he goes, Ric Flair's shoes, I gotta feel it. What did you think about this match, man? I really like this match. I really like the finishing sequence. You know what I've realized about Ric Flair's matches from this era? When he gets to the finishing sequence, the action doesn't get slower, it gets faster. So many of like the WWF main events are they just lie on the ground and they hit each other with the finisher and mm-hmm. they lie back on the ground, but they kick. This one, it's like Flair is like trying different shit. Sting is trying different shit. They're going for their finish, but when the finish doesn't work, they bust out a different move. And yes. they have not done that in WWE. I, I don't know what since when. And it would be so refreshing if like when Cody and Roman had their rematch at WrestleMania, the end of the match is Cody and Roman just doing wrestling moves on each other. Like they're not even going for the finishes. I just feel like they're afraid to do that, but that would be kind of like crazy. Like they do the whole finishing thing, and then they just start doing fucking moves. They just start fucking, you know, like and and then somehow so they're Cody... getting desperate. They're getting desperate, yes. right? Yeah, and it's yeah. like fuck it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna, you know what, Roman? I'm gonna fucking do a DDT. You're not gonna expect that. And Roman's like, well, I'm gonna put you in this fucking bomb. Like they just keep doing different shit, and because it, it seems yes, it, you're right, desperate. And I like that about this match, and I like the fact. That like Sting was like Sting. Sting is not st- when Sting beats Flair. He's like, I'm gonna try this, and if it works, I'm getting the fuck out of here, and it works. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so yeah, I really like that. What I didn't like, when I think kind of hurt him on this run was cutting this promo about how much he loves Ric Flair. Ric Flair tried to end his life at the beginning of the year. People want Sting to get revenge on this guy. And when he gets revenge, he's saying to everyone how how Ric Flair's like the best world champion. It's like it kind of like kills the whole um quest for revenge. Yeah, yeah. And you know, like going back to like what you said about the finish and stuff, I think like this is why people like often say they had the better wrestling. I totally get it, right? Because yeah. they did stuff like this. And when they were not handcuffed by shitty booking, right? Where they have to do a shitty finish. Because this is this is a match with like not like none of that bullshit, right? None of the fucking interference stuff. When there's no like shitty booking involved, their wrestling is better, less formulaic than WBF. Yeah. WBF, you're right. There's a it's like everyone is given a formula and you gotta do your own interpretation of that formula instead of going like just fucking tell a story where this was better. Like it's much better like that. That's why and I didn't like. Yeah. That's why I don't like a lot of AEW. I don't like Cody Dustin because Cody Dustin is basically a WWE match. You know where they're hitting finishers and then laying there for like twenty minutes, rather than like I, I'm wondering like why doesn't AEW like Kenny Omega so do a match like this like where, where you're where you're actually going faster at the end rather than going slower. You know. Yeah. Yeah, like you know who else was doing this? Like Ric Flair and uh, Rick Ricky Steamboat. Yeah, right. Yeah, right, well, that, that was what was that? Chi Town Heat or something like that? Chi Town Heat, uh, Russell War. Um, but you know, like, uh, but even Lex and Flair do it. But then it just, but you know, it leads to a shitty finish. But even they do it where like they actually speed up and do different things. Yeah, just, yeah like, where it gets like I can't beat you with my signature move so i'm gonna just bust out a move that you never really see me do and it's gonna hopefully it'll catch you off guard and you know so forth um yeah, i would I say think... this that promo you know... at the end it was weird and yeah. like he even like totally ignores gordon solely like he's like how do you feel though he was thinking but why don't you tell me how you feel and he's just like rick flair <laughs> <He's> like... <laughs> yeah and i think that like kind of i remember like i i, I was listening like Dave Meltzer said in Wrestling Observer, like kind of killed his heat doing that because people didn't want to hear like I know Ric Flair is the best, <clears throat> but in the storyline, Ric Flair is trying to like r- ruin your life. So I want you to be like Ric Flair, like you got what you deserve. Don't fuck with me. You know what I mean? That's yeah. what I want you to say. I don't want you to be like, oh, Rick. yeah, it was like kind of weird. Um, but overall, I think it was a good finish to a fucking. This is like it felt like one of the first times i've seen a wcw pay-per-view where the fans are going to leave happy this is a famous show and and i remember at the time people were very happy with this finish and people were very excited to give sting a chance and um you know he loses the belt in january but yeah i've seen this match uh wwe puts this match on a bunch of their old dvds i've seen it but this is the first time i really paid attention to it and 
yeah, I really like this match. And Ric Flair does a great job getting over Sting. And it's a very, very good match. It's not as good as Hogan Warrior, but it's very good. It's not as good as uh, Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat. But, um, but you know what? It's only in the top 10 we've seen so far. I would definitely say for the year 1990, you could put this in top five matches of that year. I would say um, I did like mid- Just I would say I like Midnight versus the Smoking Gun. So, so if you have two yeah, matches sure. that are like match yeah. of the year, so it is a good show. Yeah, I would say this is. A, I would say if you're gonna watch, you know, another thing too. While I was watching this, I forgot to mention this. While I was watching this, I was like, God damn, they've got so many like fucking legendary tag teams on this paper, yeah. dude. The fucking, I was like, the only fucking, I was like, this is almost as good as the fucking 2020 uh, AEW tag team roster. But like, it is like a Hall of Fame roster of tag teams here, you know? You know what, I, know what I, you know what I realized? The worst what? tag team on the show is the only one in the Hall of Fame. Oh no, the Steiner's in the Hall of Fame. The Steiner's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. The Freebirds, yeah. The Freebirds, I would the Freebirds say, got there way sooner. If you want to see like peak like vintage WCW, this is a show to watch, 100%. Yeah, it's good. this is a good example of WCW. All right. Yeah. Next week, we're back in WWF. It's SummerSlam 90. We got Hulk Hogan versus Earthquake and Ultimate Warrior versus Rick Rude. The week after that, Andrew D., we have Halloween Havoc with um with Sid versus Sting. In three weeks, we have Survivor Series 90 with the debut of The Undertaker. And then finally, Star K90, where it's Black Scorpion versus Sting. Which one are you excited about? So we are watching SummerSlam 90, you said? Yeah, next week. Next week. Um, I actually am interested in seeing the uh, uh, Survivor Series 1998, because you said that's the debut of Undertaker, right? Yeah. So I'm actually curious. Because like I've seen that match, but I want to see the entire pay-per-view now. Yeah, it really it's it really was a great debut. I mean, they made him they made him a superstar within seconds of that match. It's really yes. awesome. um guys, that's the show. If you enjoyed it, please follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Ray Goots, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to us on YouTube, Ray Goots Comedy, and subscribe to me on TikTok or follow me, whatever they call it, on TikTok, Ray Goots Comedy. Andrew Lee, I'll see you next week for SummerSlam. SummerSlam nineteen ninety. Bye. <laughs>